Hey fiends, uh, if you're wondering why this episode showed up a few days early, that's because we wanted to run this discussion of Tales of Frankenstein before the very special bonus episode we'll have for you at the regular time this week. So this Friday, we'll be posting a long chat that we had with the writer and director of this film, Mr. Donald F. Glute himself. Uh, it was so much fun talking with him, and we cannot wait for you all to hear it. But until then, take it away, spooky piano man. The hosts feel it would be a little unkind to present this podcast without just a word of friendly warning. We are about to unfold the story of Frankenstein, a man of science who sought to create a man after his own image without reckoning upon God. It is one of the strangest tales ever told. It deals with the two great mysteries of creation, life and death. I think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. So if any of you feel that you do not care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now's your chance to. Well, we've warned you. Hello and welcome once again to the Frankencast. I'm the mad scientist Anthony Bowman. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm joined as always by... The mysteriously appearing and disappearing scar that appears on your face between scenes, Eric Velasquez. My pronouns are also he, him. <laughs> yeah, so this week, you know, as we said said last week, we're doing uh, another Tales of Frankenstein. This one from 2018. And last week I said that it was directed by Donald F. Glut, but it's actually Glute, I found out. So uh, Donald F. Glute directed Tales of Frankenstein from a few years ago, and, um, right away, like, this movie is so much fun. Uh, it's wild, man. It, like, yeah. <laughs> holy crap. Like, it's, like, the quality is not, the quality, okay, let me rephrase that. The writing is pretty good. Everything was done on a shoestring budget, clearly. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I feel like the, the, the thing with low-budget movies is, like, you kind of run into, you know, there's a couple different kinds. You've got, like, you know, the so bad it's good, and you've got, like, the ones where, like, they're trying to be so bad it's good, but they're they're just lazy. Um, you know, like, Wild Eye, if you see much of their stuff, they, like, some of it's fun, but a lot of it just feels like cash-ins. But then you have something like this where it's like, here are some people who really, really care about the source material, who are really, really interested in making this movie, uh, and they may not have all of the resources they need to make, you know, the best version of this, but they're going to do the best they can with what they have. And it's it's really, you know, endearing to watch a movie like this. Right. And let me tell you for a fact, we can tell that this movie was made with a lot of love for one simple fact. And that one simple fact is every segment has at least one science wheel. <laughs> Some yeah. have two. Some have two. <laughs> Yeah, but every one of them have a science wheel. Yeah, like he's he's clearly paid attention. You know, he's looking at the details. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just there's so many references. I mean, obviously there's lots of Frankenstein like Easter eggs, but there's like references to you know H.P. Lovecraft, Edgar Allan Poe, um, mm -hmm. everybody involved. Like they clearly like know their stuff. They care about mm -hmm. pop culture in general, and definitely monster movies specifically. Uh, even to the point that like. Uh, the, you know, each of these segments has a date and a time, a little stamp at the beginning, and every date is a specific important date related right. to Frankenstein in some way or another. Oh, I love it. Well, I, and by the way, the science wheel is called a Faraday disc. I, I know, I'm, <laughs> but I'm just going to always keep it science wheel because I love it so much. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's our beloved science wheel. It is our beloved science wheel. All right. <laughs> So let's go ahead and get into this. We've got multiple different stories going on here. Uh, we are actually experiencing tales of Frankenstein versus one single story. This is an anthology definitely in the vein of Creepshow. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of Tales from the Crypt. All the good EC goodness just thrown in there and mushed around. Uh, I feel like, honestly, if they had the money, this would make, like, and you in between scenes you had... Uh, kind of like the comic book drawings of Creepshow, this would be even better than it is right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the the odd part about it, I guess, is like, you know, anthology is like one thing that, 
they either have like a wrap around or they don't and this kind of right. does but it doesn't really do much right <laughs> it does but it doesn't <laughs> But and another thing, the the quote unquote wraparound is is also mentioned or referenced in every single story as well, which I think is interesting. But once again, not much is done with it. Yeah. To just briefly go through with the wraparound, like it starts and it's like you've got like a very traditional Frankenstein's monster, you know, in the, the universal style who kind of like f- finds this like pile of rubble and picks up a painting um of victor frankenstein and then just kind of like gets angry (laughs) and that's pretty much it like and then at the end of the movie he sets the painting down and and walks away (laughs) right right every every once again every segment references this damn painting it's in everything oh yeah uh so and i thought they were going to add more to it but no it's just i guess the monster is somehow reminiscing about things it knew nothing about and wasn't (laughs) physically there for or or maybe it's just railing against the painting once it finds it again after so many years yeah i mean like the only because the the wraparound stuff is set in the like arguably present present, day um i think i think it says present day even at the beginning so theoretically maybe when he touches the painting it like I don't know if there's like a psychic connection and he remembers all of these scenes because, you know, like you said, the painting is in every one of these. So maybe the painting remembered uh, where it has been in the past. It has the soul of Frankenstein (laughs) in the painting. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Maybe it does. I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah. I mean, there's like some Dorian Gray kind of stuff going on. Maybe funny. Funnily enough is, is referenced in in the, in the movie uh, (laughs) once or twice. So maybe, yeah, hmm, maybe that's the through line. So our first like actual uh, segment is set in Bavaria in 1887. Did you know it had a name? Oh, d- like at the end credits, doesn't it give names for all of them? Yeah. So the first tale is called My Creation, My Beloved. And it's just a really sweet sort of like monster love story in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, you know, it's obviously kind of dark too. <laughs> right. Um, you know, because it's a monster story. And uh, another real quick thing is like, as far as like the writing goes, you know, we've you know, obviously we've watched a lot of Frankenstein movies at this point mm-hmm. yeah, for in the show. And there's some things, you know, some touch points that we see over and over and over again. This movie does a pretty good job of like coming at this from some different angles. Yeah. It, it's for, for like four stories. They're all pretty different than anything we've really talked about yet in the, uh, you know, on the podcast. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. As you were saying, like, I, I kind of figured this one was going to go a much darker route than it did. I mean, it kind of gets there eventually, <laughs> but I mean, it's still, as you said, a pretty sweet love story between two arguably unattractive people. <laughs> I mean, yeah. let, let's not mince words. That's that's kind of the the idea that they're going with here. Uh, we're yeah. following Gregor Frankenstein, and uh, he's having a little bit of uh, back and forth like um, pen pals with a Dr. Irma Reichmann, and they're kind of discussing his cousin uh well by the way this is bavaria 1887 that's when this story is set Mm. now i noticed that he keeps calling frankenstein cousin (laughs) cousin yeah well the original frankenstein was in 1818 uh we've got about 70 almost 80 years of uh (laughs) difference between the cousins so maybe great cousin i don't (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't know how that works out exactly, yeah, but <laughs> we're, we're just saying the, we, the time's a little bit off, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he's got this whole plan that he's he wants to like reform the name of Frankenstein by like continuing the experiments but getting it right this time. Um, and you kind of like you find out that they've that Gregor and Irma have had this correspondence, but that she has died. Um, she died of cancer, I think is what it says. Mm-hmm. And she even like goes so far as to like offer up her body to him for his experiments. Right. Most importantly, her brain. Yes. So then like he gets a, does he get, he gets a phone call um, that his former professor has died. Well, so he like, yeah. So this is my, this was the reference I made at the beginning. Like he's talking to the, the photo or the, um, the picture of Frankenstein. And he's talking about how he's going to get this right, swear off murder and revenge. And this is where we first see his little, like, we're going to find out that it was where he's going to be stabbed in the face, but, but it hasn't yet happened. <laughs> so it's kind of weird. I guess it was an editing error or something like that, where 
we're actually seeing that there is like a visible line where there is looks like blood where he was stabbed. So, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe some continuity in terms of like when they were filming and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, so he goes down to the morgue and kind of meets this very like sarcastic <laughs> morgue attendant. Like <laughs> legitimately like kind of creepy vibes were coming off of this guy. <laughs> yeah. He ends up paying to buy the this professor's brain um, and then, you know, is headed back home. Here we do kind of get something that we've seen a few times before, which is that he bumps into someone mm-hmm. and ends up, you know, damaging the brain in the process. So it ends up that this woman is that's like, I think this may be like a dance hall or something, but there's like some like sex workers out in front yeah. and we, we meet like these two women. One of them has like some sort of injury to her foot. She's in like a some sort of thick boot thing. I'm guessing it's like a club foot right. or, or something. But a massive, massive, massive boot. It almost looks like if you break your leg and you have to wear that that big cover, it's like a, you know, huge, thick right. thing. But so her friend ends up, like, going on a date with a guy who's, like, leaving. But, you know, of course, because she's the malformed person of this movie, right. she is having trouble picking up dates. And then a really drunk guy comes out and sort of, like, accosts her. You know, he he's a little bit too forceful or whatever. She's kind of resisting, and yeah. he knocks her down, and she hits her head. Gregor sees and, like, kind of pushes, you know. Yeah, they get in a little bit of a fight at this point. The, the guy, uh, he stabs Gregor in the face, as I mentioned earlier. Gregor stabs him back. Uh, there's there's some few funny uh, faces as uh, the guy is choked and murdered by Gregor. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> immediately after, the, the wound that was just there disappears. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so once, the, once the guy is dispatched, like, you know, Gregor looks at the fallen sex worker and you know, sees that she has died. And, of course, when you're a Frankenstein and you've got some dead bodies around you, you got to take advantage of the opportunity. Well, I mean, before she was murdered, she had a lovely head on her shoulders, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> So, yeah, of course, he saws off her head yep. and takes it home with him. <laughs> he was like, that head, I need uh, that head. That'll make everything perfect. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so, you know, of course, the brain is that he had was damaged, but he takes the, the sex worker's head with him. And then we kind of just kind of cut away to this scene of, like, I'm not sure if it's inside that same place where, where they were standing out front or if it's a, a different location altogether, but it's like a, a dance hall um, you've got a bunch of women kind of like milling around waiting for dates. I think this was like a common thing where you could like pay to dance with girls. Yeah, they definitely were like, but but they're all dressed in, in modern modern clothes because, you know, shoestring budget once again, I'm assuming. But yeah, so it was kind of like um, implied they were sex workers, but also dancers. Yeah, but then <laughs> something happens and the, uh, the dance hall catches fire mm-hmm. and you just have all these like, screaming women as the building burns down and like they clearly don't escape because the next scene is Gregor getting another call from the the weird morgue guy and he's like I, I got I got a jackpot for you right here <laughs> thank me buddy because you just hit the lottery on this one so of course you know Gregor heads back down to the morgue the guy kind of shows him and you know it's kind of like there were several women of varying stages of, of damage so you have like completely charred bodies and then you have women who died from like smoke inhalation who still look you know pretty well put together uh right so he kind of you know makes his selections from from the available uh options i guess by the way did you pick up on the uh the little rhyme that uh i guess the guy's name is Huspin. he's played by tad atkinson but uh yeah he's the kind of mortician did you pick up his little rhyme that he uh told uh our gregor no, I, I missed that. Okay, so he says, <clears throat> as he's introducing these bodies, and this makes it even worse, most croak choking on the smoke. So, <laughs> so I was like, all right, I get you. I, I'm picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> but yeah, that just adds to the super, like, this, guy's, this guy probably sleeps with some of the bodies. I'm just saying. Yeah, you definitely get that vibe from him. Yeah. I'm not saying Tad Atkinson does that. I'm saying Husband, the character. <laughs> Yeah, it's because he's a great actor. Yeah, yeah. He's... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so then we get back to uh, to Gregor's lab, and now he's got all of these various body parts. Um, so, you know, at this point, you kind of know where things are going. It's it's kind of a similar thing to, like, Frankenhooker or something. You know, he's taking all of these sex worker body parts and uh, 
you know, joining them together to make like a perfect woman. That's literally what I wrote down in my notes as well. I was like, wow, this is like Frankenhooker. <laughs> and I don't I, like I don't think that's like a coincidence. No. I, I feel like Homage. considering what we've seen from Glute, like he definitely if there is a reference to something, it's on purpose yeah. for sure. Oh, yeah. There, there'll be more later on. Also, by the way, uh, this one has a, not an ex- extreme amount of TNA, but there is definitely naked bodies. At least one. Yeah. So just be aware of that if you're not. Yeah, yeah. The, this, you know, it's definitely like that exploitation shot that it's just there to serve its purpose, but it's not like an extended, extended scene or anything. Right. Yeah, it's just there for titillation. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> but so, you know, of course, the deal here is that he's putting together these bodies, you, you know, the head from the girl that got knocked down out in front of the pub. The various other body parts, and then of course Irma's brain. Irma's brain. Um, so he's bringing his love back to life, and in like a perfect body, which again, you know, is sort of the the plot of Frankenhooker Franken- yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. But you know, like you said earlier, they've got the spinning science wheel going. There's uh, the the all the lab stuff is very it's very Hammer yeah. inspired more than like Universal. Mm-hmm. It's it's on a budget for sure. Like there's a lot of just like colored regular light bulbs that you could like you know get at the the hardware store or whatever. But yeah, there are the the, the wheels, and they look just like you would expect them to. They're they're great. And of course, the bride creature awakes and she's kind of like staggering towards him. And also, she's wearing this sort of like bikini yeah. made out of like bandages. Yeah. Which is actually is like a, a really nice sort of like veiled reference because Frankenstein created woman, mm-hmm. the poster for it has the creature, the female creature in a bikini like that, but she's never actually wearing that in the movie ever. Right. So they just like made it and actually put it in the movie yeah oh i love it it's so good but (laughs) wait a second it doesn't seem like she just wants to snuggle with gregor now she actually she's choking gregor (laughs) yeah he's you know it's like don't you know who i am and like she's like reaching out and yeah so she uh you know kills gregor and then it's like oh is this you know the scene we've seen so many times where like the creature wakes up and is just like in a murderous rampage instead of actually connecting to the brain that we would expect no 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 uh, not this time no, <laughs> no th- this time what we what we've kind of left out is that gregor has been working on a guy's body so at the beginning i was thinking oh no well or or maybe oh yes he's gonna put irma's brain in a guy's body and they're gonna you know <laughs> no 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 that was for him because you see gregor wakes up in this hunky dude's body with the revived very attractive Irma and they fall in love (laughs) yeah so they just like upgrade basically they both yeah they're older and and, you know like you said they're not the most like a conventionally attractive people Mm -hmm. uh, but now they are now they're young and healthy and you know you know he's all muscly like it's bombshell and beefcake like happily ever after presumably immortal as well yeah so good for them (laughs) So, yeah, it's, you know, it's a sweet little dark love story. And, you know, like in all the things we've talked about, the monsters rarely get a win. And this time it's like they kind of do. So, you know, that's great. That's really nice. (laughs) Good for them. Once Uh, once again. Yeah. So so that's that's the end of the first segment. Uh, And then, you know, we we get another little cutaway that's just sort of the monster (laughs) rampaging next to the the painting. It's picking up foam Um, blocks or or, I'm sorry, um, stone. (laughs) Uh, and throwing it all over the place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're in Switzerland this time. Yeah, Crawler um, from the Grave. And uh, yeah. this one is set in 1910. 1910 is the year that the original Edison yeah. Frankenstein movie came out. So that's that's what that one's referencing. Yeah. Yeah, it starts off with just, like, a weird sort of dream sequence, like, right out of the gate. Like, there's just... Yeah, we get a lady, a weird uh, signet ring. Yeah, it's, it's just, like, a couple little quick cuts, and then, like, he wakes up, he walks downstairs, and this guy is such a weirdo, I'm, like... <laughs> he is a Tales from the Crypt character. Like, it is so bizarre. I have never seen a human being just wake up from a nightmare, go downstairs, open up their box of jewels and riches, and just gingerly stroke them for no reason... <laughs> Who does that? Yeah. yeah, I definitely wrote down that this segment felt very Tales from right? the Crypty. I mean, it's a, it is either Tales from the Crypt or it is Creep Show. I mean, yeah. they they have very very similar feels, and it, it is right there with them. But we're gonna find out this guy's name is Vincent, 
And the reason why Vincent's so important is because he really, 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 really likes the ring that uh, that a another Frankenstein, a helmet Frankenstein, uh, played by uh, Lynn Wine, a uh, comic book yeah. fucking god, Lynn Wine. Yeah. Okay. Creator of Swamp Thing. Right, Swamp Thing. He also created Storm, right, from X Men. And I think Wolverine. Yeah. Too. I mean, listen. The, we we have so much to thank this guy for. I mean, aside from that, he wrote what um, titles like Adventure Comics with Supergirl, uh, The Flash, Superman. Like he was he was a DC and Marvel giant, and unfortunately, he did pass away during the filming of this movie. And he is given his uh, posthumous thanks and dedication in this movie. So Donald Glute has also written comics, and like mm-hmm. they were friends. Um, and apparently, like, Lynn asked, like, yeah, I, I, you know, I know you're filming a movie. Can I, like, have a small part in it? And apparently he wasn't in great health, but they, you know, they found a part where he didn't have to do too much and wasn't going to be in it for too long. Um, so he was able to do that, which is, I mean, you know, it's really cool to just have that last little, like, time capsule from him. Right. And honestly, it's, it's a pretty good performance. I mean, yeah. you know, he's only in it for a, for a little bit, but still. You definitely get the feeling that he is a rather embittered individual who, you know, would do the things that happen in this. Yeah, and especially for, like, you know, not being an actor. Like, he's just a comic book guy. But, yeah, he, yeah he, he's pretty convincing. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Um, so, but, yeah, so we've got this <laughs> creepy Vincent who just loves jewels. Loves and the <laughs> his, like, white whale of jewels is Helmut's ring, like he said. He was constantly begging him to give him the ring and always refused. Mm-hmm. So we find out that, that Helmut has died. And Vincent kind of uh, goes and speaks to Helmut's widow and is like, right, but, you know, but, now that your husband is gone, maybe you'd want to sell the ring. Yeah. You know, like, I, I've been wanting it for so long. You know. I've, I've desired it and you know she's like i can't help you out like sorry part of his you know last wishes were that he'd be buried in it so you're out of luck right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's gone yeah but of course he didn't just die from anything he died from the great death that's at least what uh two ladies who are leaving the grave site say yeah so it seems like it's either a capital letter plague or or just some other mm-hmm. sort of plague you're right yeah it's um, something but, generic play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then we get like, oh, Vincent goes and visits. Uh, at first, I thought he was like an importer because he was like, I just got all this stuff in. But as it went on, I feel like this guy's just sort of like a co- another collector, but he right. collects medical oddities. Right. Um, but let's let's also talk about as we go to this character who's named Johan, we also mm-hmm. get a cut to a black cat. That's going to be very important because there is a shit ton of Poe references. Oh yes, Just so yeah, many. and the black cat definitely. I mean, it's it's really there for atmosphere, um, mm-hmm. and and you know, I feel like there have been Poe movies that have kind of done similar things. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely like referring to to Poe here. But yeah, so Johan has like skeletons and shrunken heads and just kind of like that kind of stuff, right. you know, like, uh, including like a taxidermy raven, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so again, Poe raven, you know, right. Get it. But now they're, <laughs> they sit down and have a nice drink of Amontillado <clears throat> that he may have gotten from a cask. Who knows? <laughs> and by the way, that's the thing that tipped me off. The moment I heard that, I was like, what? And then I, I, I rewound it about a minute or two, and I was like, oh, hell, okay. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, of course, like the the plague, then you've got like, you know, the mask of the Red Death. Death. Yeah, exactly. So, so <laughs> they're kind of talking about how Vincent's frustrated that he doesn't get the ring because Helmet was buried with it. Mm-hmm. And we cut back to like a flashback where you've got like Helmet and um, Frau Frankenstein. I don't think her first name's ever said. Mm-hmm. And they're talking about Vincent. They discuss that Victor Frankenstein had an elixir of immortality and um, Helmet's trying to recreate or has tried to recreate it and, you know, believes he's successful so he drinks it but then he just turns blue yeah. and dies it, it's like that scene from game of thrones uh what was it the purple wedding when um joffrey starts choking to death and he turns blue. uh yeah 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 it's unclear here I, i'm not sure if the elixir killed him or if if it was plague yeah if it was the plague and the elixir just you know didn't do what it was supposed to do well 
Um, I think what we'll, we'll find out is it was probably plague, but once again, the elixir didn't work out as he had intended. Yeah, like it almost felt like, you know, sometimes when you have like characters become immortal, they have to die first and then they're immortal after that, you know, especially like vampires mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. But it almost felt like that maybe was the deal was that the elixir would let him die of his natural causes and then revive him. And then either the plague was too strong or the elixir didn't work at all. But either way, uh, the end result is that like we have one dead Frankenstein. Yeah, he does not wake up. He is blue and dead on the floor. And um, then, the, like, the next thing is we're back to the present, and Vincent is talking to Johan and wants his help uh, digging up helmets. Yeah, digging up helmets. By the way, uh, we do find out her name. I, I'm an idiot because I should have known because this was another Poe reference. Mrs. Frankenstein's first name is Lenore. Oh, okay. Yeah, they mentioned that. Sorry about that. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he wants Johan to help him dig up Helmet's body, and Johan's like, no, I'm not, right. I'm not doing that. He has the most sense of <laughs> any Frankenstein-related character we've seen so far. I think he does, like, say, you can borrow my shovel, right. but that's about all the help he gets. He's like, I'm not going, in, I'm not going digging in no graveyard. <laughs> Bad stuff happens there. Yeah. <laughs> And he's not wrong, because uh, Vincent goes to the graveyard and starts digging and, like, unearths the hand, and the hand, like, comes to life and starts, like, trying to grab him. Right. So he ends up, like, chopping off the hand with a hatchet. So I don't know if Helmet was just, like, buried loose or if he's already, like, dug himself out of the casket and, you know, partially right. unearthed himself at this point. Yeah, it kind of felt that way, right? Because at, at a point, the hand was actually just coming out on its own. Which also feels like maybe a tiny nod to Carrie. Mm -hmm. you know the uh the iconic last scene of carrie yeah so it, it, in the end he he chops off the hand takes the ring and <laughs> because you know he knows his friend likes medical oddities he goes ahead and takes the hand right. too i'll just take this <laughs> and, with uh, me this thing that was ru uh, rummaging around a moment ago that's all right yeah so he uh he gives that to johan puts it on a platter literally on a platter <laughs> Oh, by the way, when when the hand is snatching at uh, Vincent, uh, we start to hear a heartbeat. So there's a reference to the Telltale Heart mm. in that as well. Yeah, and they'll, that'll come. There's up. also in that graveyard. There's also a grave of Lucy Westenra mm. from Dracula. Oh yeah. There's also a grave that looks like it says Hercules, <laughs> like Hercules with an S at the beginning. Mm. And like I couldn't catch the last. It was like the last name started with an M, and I kind of tried to search. Like, is this something that I'm not? Right. I, I couldn't find anything. Maybe so that's I don't know what Hercules is, but it's a great name. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. We'll have to we'll have to find that out one day. <laughs> So then the next scene is Vincent is back at Helmet's grave and sees Lenore and she mentions, oh, did you hear Johan was strangled to death? Hold on. I do need to step back because as Johan was talking about everything that was going on before they, they took off, this man dropped a lot of names on us real quick. Uh, apparently, Johan definitely wanted the hand, but this reminded him of a time he was looking for a hand of glory. And I'm like, what the fuck? What the fuck is... Okay. It's like an old European candle made from dead people's hands. And I'm like, that's weird. That's a weird, interesting, cool s statement. But also, <laughs> this was at his time in Arkham. Arkham. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, once again, referencing other, you know, literary people, H.P. Lovecraft and the Arkham traditions. I just got really excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, the uh, revived... Um, hand definitely has a little bit of reanimator mm -hmm. um, yep. stuff kind of going on there. Mm -hmm. There are so many references to so many things. Like you, you can't possibly mark them all down, right. which is, is just, it's so much fun. Like this movie, I feel like I could watch it a couple more times and catch new things every time. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I actually think, uh, well, we'll get to that, but this is definitely repeat viewing for sure. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So as we said, uh, something attacks Johan. We're not sure it's the hand. We know it is. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so Lenore approaches Vincent the next day and is like, hey, your friend died last night. Kind of casually. <laughs> or, I'm sorry, you haven't heard your friend's dead. And, like, you know, he's definitely spooked by that, like, right away. Um, and then, like, I think the next thing is that he's asleep again and he, like, has a nightmare it's weird because it's kind of the repeating thing of lenore right like she's there there's the ring it's always lenore in the ring yeah um so he like wakes up and he 
is you know between the the nightmare and hearing what happened to to johan he's like he's done with this ring so he's trying to get it off of his finger it seems to be stuck uh as rings tend to be in movies right yeah the karmic punishment <laughs> wanted this ring so bad now it's on forever yeah <laughs> well he decides he decides there's one way to get rid of this ring and he picks up that hatchet and i'm like oh this is another tales from the crypt uh homage for sure oh yeah <laughs> Um, and like, he kind of get the vibe that he's like, he's thinking about it, but you know, it would be hard to just like commit to chopping off your finger. So he's like, he's not, he's not set on it yet. Um, but before he can make the decision one way or the other, the hand arrives, (laughs) uh, it comes crawling in. And it grabs the hatchet yeah. and goes ahead and just takes care of it for it. Right. <laughs> like, it just chops his finger off. And, of course, then we hear the heart beating again. And it turns out the fear and also having your finger chopped off by a disembodied hand uh, can cause you to have a heart attack. And Vincent <laughs> dies. Once again, in the very, like, and it, okay, I do love the end of the, the scene because it shows that the hand has gotten the ring back and it stops with hand and ring in full view and i'm like oh gosh if only they had a few more thousand dollars we could have had the like the fear lines and like all the scary jaggy like outline from creep show and that oh yeah what a way to go out (laughs) yeah yeah so everything about that like you know there's obviously all the poe references but it definitely has like that tales from the crypt thing where like somebody's Somebody's greedy and their greed sort of like undoes them, basically. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's sort of like the living hand ends up. That's that's what the elixir did. You know, obviously he, he's dead, but he's not fully dead. And the hand was still alive because of the elixir. And, and honestly, I thought if they had a few, well, they probably would need like a 10,000, 20,000, whatever extra amount of money to make it look really good. I thought they were actually going to have the character of Helmet come out and like, you know, fully or partially decomposed, missing the arm. Mm. That would have been amazing. But, yeah. you know, it is what it is. This is still a really good segment. Uh, honestly, I think it's probably my favorite. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree. Yeah, I think so. The next one is not my favorite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> House of the Death. next one. <laughs> it's. Uh, it's the one that I would I would say is is the most like problematic, although. It also is very, it's intentionally problematic, right. I, I think. Um, I feel like it is sort of making references to a time period where things were were less, Specific, <laughs> less PC. Specifically LA 1948, <laughs> which was? Uh, that was the year that um, Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein yeah. came out. <laughs> but yeah, no, so uh, I, I feel like there were a lot of bait and switches where it was like, oh, this is going to be problematic. And then it's like, no, maybe not so much. I mean, there are a couple parts that they got pretty iffy on. Yeah, I think if you are watching this and looking to be offended, you will find stuff yeah. in this. But I think if you kind of are open minded, like I, I feel like the things that are sort of you know quote unquote offensive are you're supposed to be like that's wrong, right. like that's not how that should be, you know. Um, well, yeah, because honestly, there's a lot of subversion, and it turns out that you know, I I'm trying to think of the exact way to put this. The stereotypes are not really the stereotypes. Yeah. But they they kind of are, but they're not. <laughs> but let's get into this. Yeah, so we start out and it's like it's a man driving around. He's it's, you know, very noir and it's not fully black and white, but the colors are are very washed out. Like it's almost black right. and white. He's like a detective guy. He's got like the trench coat and, and hat and all that. Like it's it's very noir. Yeah, as he's driving, uh, he's listening to an audio play of uh, assuming Frankenstein. That's definitely yeah. It sounds like it, like a radio drama kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And he actually identifies himself as Jack Anvil. Jack Anvil, holy shit. <laughs> Which is like obviously a reference to the Mickey Spillane character, Mike Hammer. Right. So his car breaks down and there's like a storm. So, you know, he's trying to get in and out of the rain, which, you know, is also a pretty common trope in, in the monster movie. The one that jumps to my mind is Rocky Horror, mm. but, you know, it's been in a lot of things. He, you know, ends up at this house course, knocks, there's nobody there. And so he just kind of lets himself in. And then he meets the first character that I, I feel like people might think is a stereotype, which is uh, this sort of like, it's like an African, like voodoo priest yeah. kind of character. Like it's a, 
uh, this this black man with with like long like braids and he's got like face paint on and everything. It's kind of all a jokey version of like a voodoo priest. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like it's re referencing like some of the early zombie yeah. movie, like the pre Romero zombie movies that were more, you know, based around like voodoo. And apparently like even like his his face paint is like a specific like Donald Glute, like track down like photos of like um, uh, it's like an, an African like war chief or something okay. um, that he tried to like recreate. So it's attention to detail. And like, you know, like you said, like it, it's a stereotype kind of character, but it's specifically referring, it's referring to a stereotype. So it kind of has to be that to make the reference, I guess. Yeah. By the way, the character's name's uh, Mogumbo and he's mm -hmm. played by TJ Storm, who is a very prolific uh, voice actor for video games as well mm, okay so i mean he's been on critical role so if you're into that oh. kind of thing he's been there uh we also got him in uh star wars jedi fallen order you know he's in there somewhere hmm. i don't know the exact part i know he's in halo wars 2 as uh, pavium so he's okay. been in a few and you know for the stereotypical appearance he is like a very well but he he's not like falling into like you know he's not talking in like witch doctor gibberish or anything like that right. he's a you know he's a very like thoughtful well-spoken clever person who you know works for the uh the doctor for this mm -hmm. this uh segment um so yeah it, it, he's kind of subverting a lot of the stereotypes while appearing to be a, a stereotype. of the stereotype yeah. yeah and in fact like the detective makes some like jokes about like you look like you're out of uh central casting right. by the way the the detective is probably the only stereotype that is ex is is exactly what he is on the tin <laughs> I mean, yeah that's it which is great yeah. like you have like the dumb white guy who is exactly what you expect <laughs> right. and then everybody else is like you know more clever than you initially think they're gonna be right but yeah so um, we once again we get a shot of the painting which the the detective's kind of interested in but also we get the illusion that this dude's the one he's the one that we need <laughs> yeah so yeah, uh, Magumbo takes like kind of like you almost didn't even catch it at first. He like cleverly takes it was his smooth. hat. That was that was the uh, smoothest <laughs> removal. I I was like, how did he not see that? But then again, maybe he just didn't feel it. Like oh, it's it's on there. It was a good move. I enjoyed it. So he like he you know he tells uh, Anvil that he's gonna go get the doctor, the owner of the house. And he heads back to the lab and uh, he's like, I think this, you know, he may be the one he shows them the hat and they're like looking at like, so it's something to do with like head size basically yeah. is, is, is what it seems to be. So he's like, this guy, this guy might be what we're looking for. We find out that the doctor's name is Dr. Mortality. Mortality. Fucking man. <laughs> love it. <laughs> Which is, yeah. I love it so <laughs> much. But then we have uh, several Asian ladies that come out wearing full, um, I don't know the name of the dress, but it's very stereotypical. You know, it's like, OK, we, we get it. There's some vaguely Asian music playing in the background as they're carrying. What is it? A pot of tea? Yeah. They've got like a little tray with like a whole sort of tea set up and everything. Yeah. So you're um, like, oh, no. <laughs> but then there's even like there's a great little thing where he says, um, well, one, he like makes a reference to Charlie Chan. Yeah. Um, but then, like, when they give him the tea, he says arigato, and they all look at, like, roll <laughs> their eyes at him see? because they're <laughs> they're Chinese, <Right. laughs> uh, and he's, like, speaking Japanese to them. Right. Um, so that's where you see, you know, it, again, like, he's the guy that's stereotyping everybody, you know? Like, he's he's the one who is, is missing the mark over and over again. Right. Oh, also, we, we didn't mention, so when, when we were with Dr. Mortality, he, he sets the hat down, and we just get... A glimpse of like a hairy hand yeah. who like that grabs the hat and like pulls it off screen. Mm. Um, so so we'll we'll see more about what may be going on there here shortly. That's a monkey business for sure. <laughs> oh, and when they give him the so when the the ladies give him the tea, they also give him a fortune right. cookie, and he opens it and it says, "Women like men with brains." brains. Yes, I love that so much. <laughs> Do you think they packed the, that fortune in every single cookie? <laughs> yeah, it's, it feels that way. Yeah, right. But yeah, they're making sure he's drinking this oolong tea. And that's he, yeah. he, he has to know this flavor is oolong. It's not the, the drugs that we put in here. <laughs> yeah. 
so Dr. Mortality does come out and they sort of start talking about the, the painting. Mm-hmm. Anvil says something like he kind of looks like Boris Karloff. Right. Or, no, he says that it sounds like the Boris Karloff story. Right. Not Because uh, I think Mortality actually says that some people say he looks, looks like, like the painting. Yeah, exactly. Mortality's like, this is Dr. Frankenstein t- kind of tells the story. And he's like, I thought that was just like, you know, from those old, old Abbott and Costello movies. <laughs> Which, beautiful. Uh, well said. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so he suddenly starts to realize that like, he, he's still awake, but he can't move anymore. Yeah, He's, he's been uh, drugged, of course. <laughs> so it's an, it's an interesting drug. So he's not knocked out. Right. Like he's just like frozen. Uh, and that, that kind of gives you this great, like villain moment where like Dr. Mortality can kind of, you know, tell his plan. Yeah. He's got a monologue. Yeah. <laughs> So he's like, yeah, you're the one we're looking for. Then we get just another like little cutaway to the ape that we saw or the, that we saw the hand earlier. And he's just like beating his chest and like he's excited about something. Yeah. And then Anvil just kind of wakes up. He eventually does pass out mm-hmm. and now he's tied up and, you know, the monologue kind of continues. Right. And so then we uh, like mortality is like, so this ape is Gargantus, and he's like, Gargantus was a gift to me from Magumbo's tribe. Magumbo's tribe. So, like, they've got some sort of, like, friendship, and, like, there's some relationship in the past, mm-hmm. and then Hammer has to make some, or Hammer, uh, Anvil, yeah. <laughs> has to make some jokes about, like, King Kong. Right. And then, did you catch this this little reference? Um, he says... He heard a rumor that apes are vegetarians. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, which, you know, we had in the... Which movie even was that? The, with the... Oh, yeah. Jeez, which one was that? Oh, no. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. But it was one of the ham- earlier Hammer Ooh, movies yeah. where there's a... Uh, Cushing has an ape that he's moved like a brain from an orangutan to a gorilla and, you know there's a mention that like they they think that apes are are vegetarians which turns out to be inaccurate uh both within the movie and also in reality (laughs) but it's definitely definitely a nod to that Mm -hmm. and so yeah mortality is basically like you know yes i'm going to remove your brain and put it in the ape why (laughs) the ape seems to be doing fine i mean and for all the like low budgetness to this movie, the ape looks really yeah, it's good. Pretty good, yeah. The, you know, a lot of times when you have like cheap ape costumes, like it's just like a full mask that has like no expression. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no like physicality to it. But this, like, you can see it's like real eyes. Like it's like you know, there's it's not just like a full head mask. Right. There's like you know something else going on here. Like, I mean, it looks better than um, than like King Kong <laughs> does in like the Toho movies. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Yeah, but it definitely has a, uh, it's kind of, you could say that this was the cousin to Fluffy from Creepshow. Oh, yeah. If you know that reference. They're very similar. It's it's like Fluffy is the, the coked out version. He's the coked out cousin <laughs> of, of this. Yeah. Yeah. Of Gargantus. Yeah, like it has a little bit more of like an elongated snout than you have on like a normal gorilla. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah. Um, so then... <laughs> We get like a great sort of scene where Anvil kind of passes out again, yeah. I guess. Uh, and by the way, he he was certain that the the um, that the three women were going to side with him in the end because that's how it works. <laughs> but it turns out yeah. they're actually married to mortality, and they're all three happily married in a polygamous relationship, possibly with Magumbo. <laughs> yeah, you know they've got a, a good thing going here. Like you got to. <laughs> Props to this sort of weird family mm-hmm. who's just like making it work. Yeah, as you're <laughs> saying, yeah, uh, Anvil is definitely having uh, hallucinations or dreams of. Yeah, so he has like this super Technicolor. You know, we've been in this sort of washed out, almost black and white color palette, and now it's like hyper color. Uh, and they're like on a beach. Everything's like bright green palm trees. Uh, you know, I think Anvil's even wearing like, uh, you know, like a Hawaiian, Hawaiian shirt. pattern shirt. So everything's just like the brightest colors. Yeah. And at first he sees the, uh, the three, uh, Asian girls and they're originally in their traditional dress. And then it just kind of like does like an old style dissolve. Uh, and they're just suddenly like in bikinis. Yeah. Like what? Coconut bra bikinis? 
wasn't it? Yeah, it's like palm frond tops mm-hmm. and like little sort of like skirt sort of uh, bottoms. Right. But there's not just um, those three. We, of course, get <laughs> many different types of women. Uh, one, there's just like dozens and dozens of women. Right. And one uncomfortably playing a ukulele, I noticed. <laughs> It's like she was like, "I'm here for the check," <laughs> or, or maybe the, she but, was just nervous. I don't know. Yeah, but like in this scene, you know, I mean, obviously, like it's you know a scene with a bunch of girls in bikinis, but it's not played for titillation as we yeah. saw this, you know, the scene earlier. Like they're just you know girls in bikinis, and like we don't really see much happen. Like he pretty much wakes up before you know anything. Like yeah, uh, before he leans into any really unpleasant stereotypes, right. they just walk around him, and eventually they line up for one last shot before he wakes up. And he is, you know, he wakes up in the ape body. Yep. He is. <laughs> he has gone back to monkey. So return to monkey. Uh, but. <laughs> Yeah, and the ending to this kind of felt a little bit like, you know, Tales from the Crypt also, because mm-hmm. he's in an ape body now, and... Still, still narrating the, the, it like he's the hard-boiled detective <laughs> that he thinks he is. <laughs> and, like, his, you know, he's his big exciting moment at the end is that, like, they give him a banana. Right. <laughs> he's like, I do sure like bananas now. And then we get, like, kind of a weird stop-motion tree thing swaying in the background as it cuts away, which, it was kind of a cool shot. Yeah. Yeah. So what's what's the plan here? What was the what was the end goal? Like what's the end game for this? Why why put man's brain into monkey when monkey's brain was doing just fine? I don't yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know if this was something that like Magumbo's tribe wanted him to do mm. or if it was just you know, we had that like was it House of Dracula or House of Frankenstein where like it just gets real weird and he's just like, I'm going to move yeah. Talbot's brain into this guy's Jeez. body and then this brain into that body. <laughs> right. And like it kind of felt like that where it's just like, we're going to do it because we can. Like, <laughs> l- let's see what happens, you know, pretty much musical brain or musical skulls, as it were. Right. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, I guess uh, just because he could <laughs> and he wants to be most like Frankenstein. Sure. Why not? So, yep, so that's that's pretty... Getting the banana is basically, like, the end of Anvil's story. <laughs> yep, that's it. <laughs> and then we get to our final segment. This is, of uh, course, after the Frankenstein monster flails around for a little bit more on screen. Yeah. Uh, and so our final segment is Transylvania 1957. Also known as Dr. Karnstein's creation. By the way, Karnstein... Well... We'll, we'll get into that. Let's let's just, uh, you know. <laughs> so 1957. So this is great. So 1957 is the year that the first Hammer Frankenstein movie came out. And it's also the year that I Was a Teenage Frankenstein came out. And both of those are definitely like part of this story. So it's, it's just great. It pretty much starts out with like the doctor about to wake the creature and and we don't really see what's going on. And then it just cuts to seven months earlier. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So he's, he's basically like, I'm going to create a, a man of science and nuclear energy or something to that effect. And yeah, then we jump back into the past. We meet Dr. Karnstein, Mm -hmm. who is, uh, he's like in a traditional sort of like German beer house. You've got a lot of like, uh, patrons who are sort of flirting with all the, the beer maids, even though this is Romania, it's like it's Oktoberfest every day. Oh, for sure. Right. So Dr. Karnstein is there with this sort of like wannabe greaser guy. He's in like a leather jacket. His name is Carl. Right. Now, when which... I saw Carl, I immediately was like, wait, did they get Macaulay Culkin? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been amazing. Right. He was he was in there for a little bit longer. And I'm like, oh, no, this is not Macaulay Culkin that I was. OK, <laughs> no, it's uh, Justin Hoffmeister is apparently the actor's name. OK. Yeah. Um, but you know, obviously Carl, we've, we've had Carl's in the past mm-hmm. in some previous Frankenstein movies and, and that's a, definitely a reference as is Karnstein, which is, um, the hammer vampire movies that aren't the Dracula right, movies. Right. The vampire lover, basically the stuff based on Carmilla, like vampire yeah. lovers. Uh, what is it? The evil twins? Was it? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I think it's called twins of twins evil. Twins of evil. That's right. Uh, but I think there's like three, maybe four of those, right. and like Karnstein is the main vampire in those movies. Right, and once and if you're a Warhammer fan, Warhammer Fantasy, the Karnstein vampires, you know, all that stuff. Uh, if you're interested in that, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know that one, but um. <laughs> we'll play some. T- we'll play Total Warhammer or Warhammer Total War, or whatever it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One day, maybe we'll do it on stream. Who knows? 
That's a promise. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, we'll find. <laughs> All right, but yes. So we have Carl and Karnstein. Uh, Carl, of course, sounds like he's from Boston, uh, or at least he's doing a Bostonian accent, and is a kind of stereotypical 1950s greaser. Yes. And if it's not obvious at this point, like I watched the commentary for this. That's where some of these little weird bits of trivia I picked up were from. Um, and the leather jacket that Carl is wearing is Donald F. Glute's leather jacket from when he was a teenager nice. that he's kept all these years. And one thing that he like Glute did that I'm trying to track down right now is that he made a lot of movies when he was a teenager. Okay. Uh, I think they were like Super 8 or something, you know, just with his friends in the backyard, but they like actually got sort of like attention outside of like his friend group. Mm-hmm. I think they were talked about in like famous monsters, mm-hmm. but there were a lot of like teen vampire type stories or teen, you know, teen Frankenstein or whatever. And they use vampire. this leather jacket over and over again in these movies. Hey. So he's just kept it all these years and like got to use it again for this, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That's a cool little Easter egg for your, for your like cinematic universe. <laughs> To a degree. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's awesome. That's really cool. But apparently the doctor thinks there's a lot of opportunity in this in Transylvania at this time in the 1950s. Yeah. Which, wouldn't that be <laughs> was Romania controlled by the USSR in the 50s? Uh, it might have been. Maybe. We'll find out. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely know more about Frankenstein than we Dude, do about yeah, that's geopolitics. True, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the doctor has this idea. He wants to buy the castle on the hill. Mm-hmm. He has heard that it w- may have been like a vampire nest in the past. There were like rumors, but it looks like the perfect place for him to recreate Victor Frankenstein's experiments. He's got like all the old notes yeah. and he wants to combine it with more modern like nuclear technology. Uh, so he's got all these plans and, you know, Carl's just like, I just want to move to America. Right. I don't know why you're telling me all this. <laughs> like, I'm just like a cool teen. Like, yeah, this is. I want to go to America. <laughs> I heard the American girls are called what chicks? I think is what he says. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want to call girls chicks. It's like, oh, you sweet little marshmallow. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Carl, Carl's kind of great, but in a greasy way. Oh yeah. Uh, so the doctor is like, if if you help me out, like I will pay you well, and you can get to America. Yeah. Uh, so of course that's that's, that's you know he's hooked. That's all Carl needs. So he's like, all right, let's do it. Yeah. So they go to the mansion and they kind of look around there for a little bit, just to, to make sure that that's what they want. Yep. And then pretty much immediately from there, they are like in a crypt right. robbing graves. <laughs> but but earlier we were introduced to a character named Radu, who's the caretaker of the graveyard. Well, Radu is definitely a believer of vampires because he thinks you know sometimes. He's watching not over not only the dead, but the undead. Yeah. So they get there and like they're specifically going after this one grave. And he's like, he's not just like, get out of here. You're not supposed to be in this crypt. He's like, stay away from that yeah, grave. That it's one that, particular you, grave. You, yeah. You don't want to touch that. Like that. Uh, that's dangerous. Right. So, of course, they like kill him. Right. <laughs> not they. And Karnstein <laughs> bludgeons the man to death with a crowbar. Well, he's the angriest <laughs> yeah. doctor we've been introduced so far. Yeah. <laughs> So they end up, rather than taking this person that they just, like this perfectly fresh dead body that would be useful. Well, maybe not so fresh, Anthony, because it's been there for a while. It's, it's in a state. Well, so the, the person that they, or the, the caretaker. Oh yeah. That, that uh, one. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. They, they leave the caretaker yeah. and they get into this, this crypt mm-hmm. and the body, he says like, it should be very old, but like the body looks perfectly preserved. Yeah. Let me clear this garlic and this crucifix off the top of the, uh, <laughs> the coffin here so we can get a better, better look at this. <laughs> if, if you don't know what the <laughs> reference is, what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know, even so they, they see that there's just like a layer of dirt in the bottom of the coffin, yeah, you know, like he's further buried in, buried in the dirt of his homeland as it were. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's kind of unclear if I'm not sure if the doctor knows what he's doing or not, right. but like he, he does say Victor Frankenstein used the best and strongest parts available to him to make the monster, and I'm doing the same, which leads me to think maybe he does know what he's doing. Ah, um, the, the jury's out on that one, dude. <laughs> As, <laughs> yeah, by the end. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's it's very unclear what his exact motives are, but like I mean, if you're gonna try to make the strongest yeah. monster, if you could use vampire parts to create a Frankenstein right. monster, you do it, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, he definitely thinks he knows exactly what he's doing. <laughs> Meanwhile, we get like another or somebody else like wandering through the crypt. And sees like damage at that particular tomb and is like, oh no, this this isn't good. Right. Uh, <laughs> All that vampire's up to his shenanigans again. <laughs> so and then we cut back to um, the lab and we've got Carl helping them get sort of the lab set up. Yeah, the, and the photo gets it, hung up. The the picture from earlier gets hung up again yeah and you know if you haven't noticed all the spinning science wheels previously uh, carl pulls the spinning science wheel out of a crate and brings attention <laughs> to it like take care of that or carnstein says take extra care of that that's a it's a unique and rare pro or not prop i'm sorry uh <laughs> yeah but that's basically what he says like take care of that prop. yeah he says like these vintage pieces are irreplaceable. I'd have to send out to London to get another oh, one. I love so it. Like, <laughs> He's a collector. Yeah, so so good. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Uh, and so then we cut back to the pub, and you've got you know the Oktoberfest crew hanging out again. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've heard about the, the damage at the cemetery and that Radu is missing. Um, you know, he, he's a regular, and he hasn't shown up. So uh, everyone's like kind of concerned that something, you know, suspicious is going on. Right. Um, and they kind of like various people sort of volunteer, like we need to go to the, the graveyard and find out what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but they end up like basically all going by the end. Right, of it. Yeah. They're all going. Uh, I think the priest stays. Yes. He is the only one who <laughs> stays behind. Like even at the end, like all the guys are like, oh, all right, we're going to go. And then the barmaids are like, well, we're going to, if you're going. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're all going to go. And the priest is like, I'm just going to sit here and drink. Yeah. <laughs> but at this point, as, after they do that, we, we learn something shocking about Dr. Karnstein. Dr. Karnstein is not a Karnstein or Karnstein. He's a Frankenstein. <laughs> yes. And his parents were really worried that he would be one of the few members in their family that would express the Frankenstein gene. Anthony, <laughs> there's a Frankenstein gene. It's genetic. <laughs> uh that's that's just gr that's hilarious writing like uh, yeah i love it so much uh but, that reminds me i don't know if you watched the like the riverdale show the like the recent one um i watched a couple seasons of it and there's like a whole plot line where like one of the kids is afraid they inherited the serial killer gene no, from their <laughs> serial killer father right that's kind of like uh what is it <laughs> tucker and dale versus evil as well where the kid literally <laughs> inherits the uh, serial killer gene from their parents. <laughs> yeah. Or from the dad. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, Karnstein, or Frank Frankenstein, Karnstein. You know, tells this whole story. Um, Frank, and Frank Karnstein. Frank Karnstein. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> um, and he's like, okay, but there, so there is one missing piece to the uh, Right, Carl? There's this the one missing piece. Carl? Carl? <laughs> <laughs> and when there's one piece left for the monster, you know what they they always save for last. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they need a brain, and Carl's like, "I'm I'm sorry, I'm not gonna murder somebody just for you to get a new brain. Right. This murder stuff, I'm done with it. We did it once. I'm <laughs> I'm out." And you know, Carsey's like, "That's fine, Carl. That's fine. You don't <laughs> you don't have to be involved in that part." <laughs> and he's like, "I so I no longer need your assistance, but your brain is another matter." Mm -hmm. A gray matter, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so, of course, uh, he kills Carl and starts in on the brain surgery. And meanwhile, we had, like, the pub people are talking about the, the desecrated graves, and they think that Karnstein is a vampire. Right. They think that's what's going on. He's got to be, right? That's that's the only thing around <laughs> here. There's there's no people that just resurrect the dead. It's va it's vampires. <laughs> they come back from the dead. Yeah, we're in Transylvania, yeah. right? We're not in, uh, you know, the various... Ingolstadt uh, or... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so while the reviving scene is going, there are two spinning science wheels dun, dun, dun. working in tandem. <laughs> And the, so the creature wakes and the creature in this scene is really cool. Yeah. Like it's, it, this is a really unique sort of character design. Um, it still kind of has like the, the flat top that we've seen, but it's 
blo- like it's bloody like you can tell this is made up of of parts like it's not he hasn't cleaned it up yet well, it looks looks nasty yeah, and it looks like through the front front lobe of the the monster's forehead where the 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 flat top is created it almost looks like there's a hinge embedded in the flesh and bone mm-hmm. maybe that maybe he just pops the, uses that to pop open the skull cap <laughs> to pop a new brain in there but yeah yeah it, it's it's and cool then, <laughs> yes and then the coolest thing uh so the creature gets up and walks over to a mirror you know, which, uh, you know, again, like the mirror scene is such an important scene in all these Frankenstein movies mm-hmm. so that the creature can see itself. But what happens when you build a monster out of vampire parts and then put a human brain in it? Turns out you just, you just see the brain. <laughs> There's just a floating brain in the mirror. It's so, so cool. I, Do you think that I was an Invisible that. Man reference to a degree? I, yeah, I can see that. It felt like some, you know, also the just like all the universal movies where they like have played around with, with vampires and mirrors. But yeah, obviously, you know, there's a lot of, they, they like to play with the invisible man having like some visible and some not visible things and having them float around and stuff. So yeah, I, I could definitely see that. Yeah. But this, this uh, version of Carl is jacked. He's huge. <laughs> yeah. He's grown about what? Three feet. Oh yeah. So we see the, the sort of floating brain and then, we see what Carl sees when he looks in the mirror, which Carl. is just himself. Yeah, he, he doesn't know that he's like this hideous vampire monster. Yeah, he's just fixing his hair. Yeah, and, uh, you know, he sort of starts, like, coming towards the doctor, and he's like, Carl, do you remember me? You know, again, pretty pretty standard stuff. And then he says, I, we thirst. Right, and that's so, when you know things which, are going south real quick. <laughs> Yeah, which I love the, you know, it's not often that we have Frankenstein things where they sort of refer to that, like, maybe this creature made up of multiple creatures would have some sort of, like, hive consciousness yeah. of the various things, you know. Um, so I guess, you know, specifically because we've got vampires here, they might exercise a little bit more control, right. even though there's not a, a vampire brain. I guess in this instance, though, it would make sense for the body to take over the brain because I guess the blood is poison, something like that. I don't, I don't know the physics of vampire and monster. <laughs> I was, but yeah, so him. clearly, like yeah. he's, you know, he's thirsty, and you know, turns out the town's folk just showed up. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we get like the the angry mob, um, and they're ready to attack the doctor as well. So he's like, you know, I command you, creature, protect me. Um, yeah, because well, the whole point of him creating the monster is he wanted a, a slave, effectively, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it turns out when you when you choose vampire as a constituent component of your creature, that doesn't work the way you want it to work. <laughs> no, so, it does not. So Carl tucks into uh, Doctor Karn Franken Frank Karnstein's neck and uh, starts doing what vampires do. Yeah, and uh, so, yeah, he, he, like, you know, bears his fangs, and it looks great. Yeah, he, he attacks him, and then the mob sort of, like, swarms in. And then we, we hadn't mentioned this before, but, like, this this ends with a really great callback because every time that, like, oh, Carl yeah, they, and Karnstein have replenish. been in the pub, yeah, let's, he, every time he wants another glass of wine, he says replenish. Mm-hmm. Um so the last thing is he's drained the doctor and the mob is coming at him and he just looks right at the camera. His eyes glow red and he just says, replenish. I love it. So good. <laughs> yeah. What a way to go out. But then, of course, of course, we then move on directly to the monster being sad over the painting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep, and that's pretty much so like we get the, the monster setting the painting down and walking right. away. Uh, and you get this sort of like voiceover thing, which is a quote from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, mm-hmm. like from, you know, the actual novel yeah, that says he was soon lost in darkness and distance. Yeah, which that was too cool of a line to go have gone out on with. the. I mean, I get that you need kind of a wraparound, but I would have liked more rap to my around. Oh, for sure. Like I would have liked and to like, have more. That that Frankenstein looked, looked good. Cool, yeah. Like it's it seemed weird to have gone to the trouble to design this character, and then, I mean, he's in the movie maybe five minutes total and doesn't really do much of right. anything. Anytime they call, they do call back to Frankenstein create a monster. You get a brief shot of the monster doing something random, 
like picking mm-hmm. flowers or wasn't one of them like he was skipping through a field or was that just my so, fever yeah. dream of this movie no that sounds right <laughs> yeah it's just just random callbacks through all throughout anytime they mention frankenstein and the and his yeah monster. And that, like, I think if I had one complaint about that this movie, I think that would be it. Mm-hmm. Is that like, if you're gonna do an anthology, either just like do standalone things that don't have a wraparound, or lean into the wraparound a little bit harder. Because right. uh, like, you know, I think of like the Tales from the Hood movies and stuff, and like the wraparound is such an integral part of that mm-hmm. movie, uh, or all three of those movies yeah. really. Um, but you know, specifically that first one, you know, like it, it, it's such a big part of it. And I I mean, I know the movie was, it's pretty long, you know, it's, it's like a full two hours. Um, so it would have been tough to like squeeze much more in, but I I think they could have done a little bit more with the wraparound. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just going to chalk it up to the fact that they probably ran out of money and they were doing the wraparound last to, I guess, make it work. It could be. And, but all in all, this is, this is a pretty solid movie. Like, I'm not obviously they probably weren't going to sell it to a major studio, especially in 2018. But yeah. you know what? It's fine. Go watch it. Yeah, I mean you you could definitely do worse. Yeah. Like it is it is a lot of fun. Uh I mean and you know, if you think about like especially Frankenstein movies in, you know, the past, you know, 5 to 10 years, like uh I I can't think of one that's that the, that is this good. Right. Um what year did I Frankenstein come out? That's probably around. Oh, that was 2014. Yeah. So that's a little older. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely one of the best of recent years as, you know, especially considering the, the budget and everything. Um, it's one of those movies where like you can tell they put a lot of love into yeah. it and they sque you know, they did the Corman thing of like every penny is on the screen. Right. Like they made the best of what they had. And like we said, it's, it's not a so bad. It's a good movie. It is, it is good. It's, there are there are definitely moments where you know you see the the stitches because the you know the budget they couldn't make it as pretty and as yeah. polished as they might have wanted to, but it's not bad. It's not uh, you know it's not like laughable or anything. No, not at all. I, definitely, uh, definitely, it is a movie that if they had thrown more money at it, it would look a little bit better in parts. The story was solid. I mean, the only weak link we had was the um, the Madhouse of Death. You know, everything else was great. Even the the very beginning where you're coming at it from the monster love story angle. Yeah. I mean, there's... yeah. And like the one that that is like the weakest link, it still has, you know, it still is coming at the story from a unique perspective that we've not really seen played out that way before. Like just the noir thing and the, the like animal experiments and, you know, this sort of weird sort of polyamorous family. Like there's right. there's a lot of strange stuff that we've not, you know. We've not explored in any previous movie we've talked about, so uh, you know, it's not lazy. That that's you know, there, there's it's like swinging for the fences in every one of these segments, and you know, if one of them is better or worse in your opinion as you watch it, like yeah. you you know, you can't fault it for for trying. I mean, and also, okay, I will say this: if you're a fan of Resident Evil, you might like Madhouse of Death just because it stars the face of Leon Kennedy. Okay? So just... I I should have mentioned that earlier. Jameson Matthews, apparently he was the face that Leon Kennedy... The new Leon Kennedy was based on. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Huh. That makes sense. Yeah. So just (laughs) just throwing that out there. (laughs) But yeah, check it out. Yeah. Highly, highly recommend this one. It, you know, it's one that that's probably it's not going to be on streaming services. You're probably going to have to like, you know, you're going to buy it or you're going to have to find it. You know, um, some other way than than you, it's not going to show up on Netflix or anything like that. But it, it's worth finding. Yeah. Definitely go at it, knowing that it's going to be fun. It may not, you know, you're you're going to have to have an open mind about it, as we said earlier. So, yes, I agreed. All right, so what's coming up next, Anthony? So next week, we are finally getting to a movie that we have referenced probably more <laughs> than any other movie in the, the course of, of this podcast so far. It's finally time for Monster Squad. Dun, dun, dun! Yes, man, Scott, <laughs> I'm excited. All right. Yeah. I, yeah, I love Monster Squad so much, and it's it's probably one of the movies that we will 
cover on this that I've seen the most. Like I have watched this movie dozens and dozens so of times. times. It's yeah. So I'm very excited to to talk about it here. Oh, yes. Um, All right. So you know where to check us out. Uh, if you're listening to us on YouTube, uh, do the likes, do the subscribes. Same on Spotify or whatever platform you're listening to us on. Uh, also throw us a line at uh, the Frankencast on Twitter. Uh, I believe. Uh, do we have Instagram? Yeah, it's yeah, it's the Frankencast at Twitter and Instagram and Gmail. Gmail. So yeah, where, wherever. I think that's pretty much it. Just those three. But but yeah, the Frankencast and all those spots. Yeah. Um, and we've been you know we've been talking to a few people on Twitter here and there, and that's been really fun. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, definitely. Just let us know how you feel. If you liked it, didn't liked it. Uh, if you want Anthony to replace uh, me with someone else, let him know. No, I'm kidding. Please don't do that. Uh, <laughs> To be continued. Looks like you survived another episode. The Freaking Cast is a production of FCR Media. It's hosted by Anthony Bowman and Eric Velasquez. Follow us on Twitter at The Freaking Cast or send us a letter at thefreakingcast at gmail.com. Our cover art is by Amanda Keller. You can find her at Keller Illustrations on Instagram. Our theme music is by Vivek Abhishek. Thanks for listening.